Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Check. Open online today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. Tony Andraki here with Andy Martinez and Andy, we have a great podcast on tap. We have the Cubs Vice President of Pitching and Director of Pitching and Assistant GM, Craig Breslow. He has one of the longest titles in the organization. Also, just an extremely smart guy. And uh, you'll hear that in the interview. But it was a great peek behind the curtain in the Cubs pitching infrastructure. Everything that we've seen since he joined the organization three years ago and really how the Cubs have developed in that regard. But Andy, first up, we're... On the day of the World Series starting, we're recording this Friday morning here, World Series is about to start. I'm curious, as you see, you know, the Astros and Phillies about to face off here, what are your initial thoughts, takeaways, and do you have a prediction for how this World Series is going to play out? Yeah, I think it's the it's a matchup of the best team with the Astros. I think they've been the you know the best team in the American League. They've you know, the Dodgers took all the spotlight, but the Astros were just as good uh, on the AL side. They were they're phenomenal from from day one till till now. And then you got the hottest team in the Phillies where, you know, it seems like every every other at bat, Kyle Schwarber, Bryce Harper, someone's hitting a home run and and Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola are just, you know, going seven shutout innings. It, it, it's the recipe for success, right? It, it's kind of a lot of vibes of the 2019 Nationals in a sense, um, in, in my end, where it's, you know, they're, they're just coming together at the right time. Uh, but as t- in terms of a prediction, I think it, it's just too hard to not to to go with the with the Astros with how good their pitching has been, with how good their their offense has been. So I guess I'll go uh, Astros in, in five. Yeah, I mean, to me, I look at this World Series and it's there's so much to learn and take away from each World Series, I think, especially from the Cubs p- position as, you know, a quote unquote rebuilding team. But you can look at it from the Astros sense. And Andy, you pointed this out to me earlier this week that like they've built this almost completely in-house, like almost Mm -hmm. everybody on their team is a homegrown player, you know, and then obviously they supplement it with trades and signings and stuff like Justin Verlander, but like they've built this team, you know, brick by brick. And then the Phillies in large part have signed this team and, or acquired it in some form or fashion. There's no wrong way, obviously. I mean, both things work, but I think then you look at the rosters too. And I mean, starting pitching and bullpen is, is huge because like you just mentioned, Nola and Wheeler have been incredible for the Phillies. And then you have Framber Valdez, Lance McCullers, and obviously Verlander for the Astros. And then both bullpens have been well because they have some dynamic stuff, some under the radar names, and then you just get timely hitting. And, and that's always, it seems like it's always the formula for these postseason teams that we see in the world series. Occasionally there's a team that goes against the grain, but typically even back to, like you said, to the nationals, like they had Strasburg and Scherzer and then they had timely hitting, you know, and that's yeah. really what it comes down to is some big studs and horses in, in the, on the pitching staff and particularly in the rotation. So as the Cubs are looking forward, I think that's obviously a big thing to take away there. I, to be honest, I always go with the hot team. And I mean, the Astros are great. They haven't lost this postseason, so they're super hot too. But something about the Phillies run just seems magical to me. So uh, I'm going to say Phillies. Um, I, I don't know that I feel super confident in that prediction. Uh, but, you know, I, I think uh, I think the Phillies have enough of what it takes to kind of get there. And I just think it'd be kind of cool to see Schwarber win again and Bryce Harper win a World Series for the first time. So it'll be a really fascinating World Series to watch, though. Yeah, and I do want to add on too. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned how great their pitching's been because you know the clear, probably the clearest AL Cy Young Award winner is Justin Verlander, and he's been their worst pitcher this this postseason, which yeah. tells you a lot about their pitching, where they haven't lost a game, and and their ace has not been you know pitching to what that he has pitched to all season. So that 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 kind of speaks to that. And to what you're mentioning on the Cubs side, you know, the the Astros were kind of in a similar sense where there's a lot of guys like, I mean, I'm sure maybe in Houston it's a little bit different, but outside of perspective, you didn't hear much about someone like a Framber Valdez or a Luis Vasquez or a Brian Abreu, all these guys that have come up and pitched key innings on the Cubs sense. You know, we look at the second half, you know, I can't say I, I, I would venture to guess not too many, you know, hardcore fans outside of hardcore fans. have heard of Javier Assad or, or, you know, pitchers like that, that have come up and, and pitched well, Adrian Sampson, another example, you know, it's crucial to have that, that depth. And, and we see that with the Astros and, and, you know, we, we kind of saw it a little bit in the second half with the Cubs. Yeah, and as we're talking about pitching, obviously, who better to hear from than the guy who heads up the Cubs pitching infrastructure and explains how they get to that depth and, and what they're doing as an organization to work toward that point in the postseason. So let's hear now uh, our interview with Craig Breslow. All right, now we welcome into Craig Breslow on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Craig, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate having you on here. 
My pleasure. Great to be with you this morning. So first up, um, you know, I know you have an interesting title like vice president and director of pitching for the Cubs, obviously, in addition to assistant GM here. But can you give us a little insight and give our, our listeners a little insight, too, as to what that entails on like a day to day, week to week basis? Like what does the VP and director of pitching kind of look like and, and what your role is uh, really on a day to day basis? Sure. So <clears throat> I think technically it means that I'm overseeing our pitching infrastructure. I think practically uh, I'm really fortunate to have a bunch of great people in the department that make it possible uh, for me to kind of have this title and also some broader assistant GM responsibilities. Uh, we have a great staff starting with our major league group all the way down to the guys that we have, uh, you know, in the pitching infrastructure and player development in, in the academy and the DR. Um, so day to day trying to kind of align the vision, uh, the overarching philosophies of, of the pitching program with, uh, you know, kind of what our day-to-day execution implementation of, of initiatives is. Um, so going back, you know, three years or so, uh, you know, obviously the, the organization had been pretty outspoken about our struggles to develop homegrown pitching talent. And we kind of gave our player development and pitching development apparatuses uh, a facelift. Um, with that came some turnover, uh, some new coaches, new philosophies, uh, new ideas. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I think I was able to be surrounded by some great people who helped uh, implement that vision. Um, I think we're starting to see the, the fruits of that work uh, now. But, you know, as it relates to kind of the, the responsibilities, um, I think it's just ensuring that con- continuity and alignment. We spend a ton of time uh, building out the infrastructure, understanding and researching and analyzing, you know, what successful player development, pitching development apparatuses look like and try to uh, you know, kind of replicate those in a lot of ways and in other ways, make sure that we weren't lo- losing sight of the importance of individualizing, um, you know, development for each of our players and staying ahead of kind of where the rest of the industry was. And you, I know we were talking a little bit before we kind of hopped on this podcast here, Craig, but just how does that differ maybe from in season to off season? Like what is your job different, you know, duties kind of look like when the team is not playing, when minor leagues are not going on versus when the season is in full gear? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. I think this job uh, is a constant balance balance between, uh, you know, kind of short term crisis response and long term development, uh, strategic planning, planning and, and vision um, in season. Right. We're dealing with roster transactions. Uh, you know, availability of pitching, making sure that every every team from our major league team down to each of our affiliates is, you know, kind of staffed with pitchers who can get through the game the next night. Um, we're trying to balance that with the goal, you know, in the minor leagues of development and the goal in the major leagues of winning as many games as possible. Uh, the constraints within which we we have to work during the season are pretty clear. Uh, we have games, we have innings, we have roster limits. Uh, in the off season, many of those constraints are lifted, right? Um, you know, the... The other side of all of this is, you know, we don't necessarily have the same kind of day-to-day interaction with our players in the offseason. We're certainly taking steps to mitigate some of that. Um, and often players don't have necessarily the same resources in the offseason. But uh, lifting, you know, kind of the constraint of needing to play in tonight's game is a huge burden um, that, that we can alleviate. And so, you know, in its very simplest terms like the goal of the offseason is development right how do we make our players better such that they can contribute to winning major league games Craig how often are you in season talking with Tommy Hadoui but also other pitching coaches throughout the organization to make sure the plan for a guy you know you guys are all on the same page so when a guy goes up from you know single a to double a or from triple a to, to the majors that they're you know on the right path that they're doing everything that that you guys have, have, have wanted as an organization yeah, probably more than Tommy would like. Uh, <laughs> no, um, t- Tommy and I have a great relationship. He has, uh, you know, a marked um, humility and modesty, uh, an excellent communicator. I think in a lot of ways, the the major league pitching infrastructure has kind of served as a model for the rest of the organization, just in terms of collaboration and continuity and alignment between what is happening at the big league level and what's happening in PD. Um, so to answer your question, I talk to Tommy every day, mostly, you know, mostly multiple times a day. I talk to rest of the rest of the staff uh, almost as frequently uh, and then speak to our minor league coaches, you know, a few times a week, our coordinators essentially every day, um, you know, people in the office every day. And like I said, I'm, I'm really lucky to be surrounded by 
really competent, uh, diligent, dedicated, invested people. And that makes it, um, you know, such that I don't need to micromanage or, you know, micromanage our pitching coaches every day. I don't want to, I don't think that's the right way to develop a system. I think, you know, what we try to do from the office is kind of apply the guardrails, make sure everyone is clear on what the vision is, what kind of the broad parameters are, and then ensure that we're leaving the, how we get there largely up to the coaches and coordinators who have interactions with the players day to day. Greg, you alluded to it a little earlier, just about, you know, three years ago when you kind of came on board and and some of the things that you've helped to change within the organization and just in your role. Um, but how have you seen the pitching infrastructure as a whole grow in your time in the Cubs organization? And where do you feel the overall state of pitching is in the organization now versus, you know, just a couple of years ago? Yeah, so I think there are there are two things, right, that you can think about in any kind of development mechanism. There's generally just like, directional alignment, making sure that everybody's kind of moving in the same direction. And candidly, it's really hard to make players worse if you have that. Like you have to pick, you know, a really, really awful direction to push people in. And very rarely does that actually happen. Now, I think there's room on the margins to ensure that the direction you're moving is incrementally better than maybe what other organizations, uh, what other directions organizations are moving in. But nonetheless, I think one thing that we, you know, that we really set our sights on was just achieving this kind of broad alignment. Everyone in the organization from, you know, the office to our on-field staff to our pitchers knew what we valued. And we derived what we valued from a robust uh, analysis of what successful major league pitchers look like and kind of worked backwards from there to identify, you know, what does the what does the pitcher who goes on to have a successful major league career look like when he's in the Dominican Republic Academy, when he's in Arizona complex leagues, when he's in low A, right? Because what we're solving for is not the best DR pitcher, ACL pitcher, high A pitcher, low A pitcher. We're solving for the best major league pitchers to contribute to winning as many major league games as we possibly can. Um, And so, you know, I think one thing that we identified early on, the ability to generate swings and misses in the strike zone is supremely valuable as it relates to predicting future success. So as a result, we focused on building out stuff, velocity and pitch shapes. Um, And I think we we largely got that right. Um, We've seen massive jumps in just kind of the raw traits of our pitchers. Um, Now, alongside that, we're recognizing there's also a need for execution. Uh, You know, it's great to have premium velocities, elite pitch shapes. Uh, If they're not competitive, um, there's not a whole lot to do with them. And so, you know, we've kind of shifted uh, a little bit to make to ensure that, um, you know, we can kind of hybridize our development there. and, you know, I think the second part of your question, what is the state of Cubs, you know, kind of pitching development, I would say it's healthy with plenty of room to improve. Um, you know, our goal, because you know, it's really difficult to forecast which of, you know, the hundreds and some odd pitchers in our organization are going to go on to become successful major leaguers, uh, you know, because that's so difficult, we owe it to each of them to invest in them and to give them the best development pathway that we can, irrespective of how probable it is that that ends up in you know Wrigley or any other major league ballpark. Um, and so, you know, I do think across the board, we've had plenty of guys who have taken a step forward. Um, but as I said, like we've also recognized as we're going, the need to have the humility to recognize and appreciate when it's time to pivot, um, you know, when it's time to, uh, you know, kind of hybridize development programs and making sure that we're focusing on an execution portion alongside the build out of stuff or, you know, when this isn't kind of a raw traits problem, this is a usage or intent problem. Um, and, you know, I think we've got a very cross collaborative uh department um, that's working very closely with other domains um, to ensure that we're getting the best information we can to make those decisions. Kind of, you know, off of that, when you're, when, you know, the scouts are looking to, to, to find the young talent that comes into the organization, what is the, the val- what's like the most important thing when you're looking, or is it just, you know, trying to find the, the, the best pitcher? Like, what are you looking for? Is it stuff? Is it velo? Or do you maybe see a guy with velo and say, Hey, we can, we can add stuff or, or how does, what's that kind of process like? Sure. Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think the outcome that everyone is hoping to achieve is, uh, you know, as an organization, we can we can kind of codify uh, the areas in which we are very successful enhancing and developing and, you know, acquire players uh, who have that deficiency or need uh, and, 
exhibit the, the traits or characteristics that we struggle to, to develop. Um, you know, I don't think it's much of a secret across the industry that uh, given training programs and implements, um, velocity is now something that we all appreciate. We can improve uh, pitch shapes to a similar degree with, you know, kind of the emergence of technology that allows us to understand the effects of, of grips on spin, on spin characteristics, uh, you know, We'll talk about seam orientation and seam shifted wake. I think we understand pitch physics um, and we're, we're trying to kind of work backwards to better understanding the way that human movement drives some of those pitch physics. Uh, but if we think about stuff and velocity as things that we tend to do well, um, the other kind of pillar that, uh, that, that we think about is command and command is far more difficult uh, to improve, to teach, you know, We've had a ton of success with guys walking into the pitch lab and coming out with, you know, a wipeout slider or a hammer curveball uh, yet to send a guy into the pitch lab and have him walk out with plus plus command. All right, we're going to take a quick break here on the Cubs weekly podcast and hear from our sponsor, Wintrust. When we come back, we'll have more with Craig Breslow. Get your Wintrust exclusive debit card. Get your Cubs card. Ooh, I'll take one. How much? Actually, they pay you $300. You heard right. Get a $300 bonus when you open a Cubs checking account with Wintrust. Enjoy all perks and purchase with pride every time with your Wintrust Cubs debit card. $300? What? $300? Get your exclusive card at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Only $100 required to open. No monthly minimum balance and no monthly maintenance fees. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Craig, we've seen the the success and fruits of that labor, like you were mentioning too, just especially in the second half of the season. And really even with guys like Justin Steele, Keegan Thompson, Brandon Hughes all having breakout years, but then even, you know, Javier Assad, Jeremiah Estrada coming up, Hayden Wesneski after acquiring him. How rewarding is it to to see some of these homegrown guys? And then even a guy like Wesneski, who was only in the organization for about a month or so before coming up, to see them, you know, succeed at the big league level. And how has the organization helped these young guys succeed almost from day one when they get up to the big leagues? Sure. Well, again, I'll I'll kind of, you know, deflect to it's great to be able to sit here in front of you and answer these questions as yeah. you know kind of to, to some degree like the face of the pitching group there are a lot of people doing a lot of work behind the scenes that you know are owed a, a ton of credit um from from the top down right and and you know i think you know you talk about steel and thompson and some of those guys who have developed and emerged in the big leagues uh, is, is pretty unique, right? So Tommy and and his group, CY and Moscow's and Danny Halton and Garrett Lloyd and Alex Smith, and, you know, on and on and on and David Ross, right? For pushing development at the big league level. Uh, I think gone, you know, extinct are the days when someone walks into a major league clubhouse as a finished product, but it takes a special coaching staff to commit to putting in the work um, to help those guys develop because it'd be really easy to simply say, Hey, these guys aren't ready yet. Give me somebody else. Right. But I think, you know, they've kind of embraced the challenge that development can happen in the big leagues. And that's why we saw guys take a step forward. Guys added pitches to their repertoires, guys tweaked their usage in the major leagues to have more success. And then thinking about, you know, PD um, it's a really close group of players and staff. I think every player feels the investment that the organization has made in them and not just, you know, with respect to a pitching coach, but a manager, a strength and conditioning coach, uh, you know, the medical staff, right? This is a very vast uh, reach that impacts our players. And I think, you know, what one thing that has been really neat as guys come up through the system and have success in the big leagues is that everyone takes pride in that. You know, it isn't about you know, who his pitching coach was that season, um, but everyone, whether it's because the player spent an off season in Arizona and we have a, a you know a group of staff there, or a player made a rehab assignment somewhere, um, you know, or moved through multiple levels, everyone feels some responsibility and some contribution to that success, and it's a really neat thing to be a part of. The the depth is something that you know was very apparent in the second half when when you think about the rotation that started the the beginning of the year when you have Drew Smiley and Wade Miley and Kyle Hendricks and all those guys are hurt you're kind of thinking from an outsider, you're kind of thinking, well, well who's going to fill these spots? Then you see these guys happen. How rewarding is it for you? And, and how crucial is that to have that depth where, you know, if a guy come, goes down, you can call someone up and they can make a start and you're not skipping a beat. How crucial is that for long-term success of an organization? Yeah. I mean, I think it's invaluable, right? Um, you know, if some of these guys who had some success, you know, in the second half of this season, start our season and, you know, start 2023 and triple a, 
that just speaks to the health of of kind of the you know the, the pitching infrastructure in general. It speaks to the depth you know in in our, in our major league team. Um, so you know I think it's it's critically important, right? I mean the fact that you know when one of the pitchers that you mentioned is injured and we need to bring up a starter that we were able to have a debate over who the right person was. Uh, you know, it, it, I think it just shows the progress that we've made, right. You know, if we were having this conversation a couple of years ago about who is the best pitching prospect, right. There were times where I think, you know, Alzale was the clear consensus and then Braylon Marquez was the clear consensus. Right. And like now the fact that we can debate this, um, I think is exactly where we need to be. We need to not know who the, you know, who the top pitching prospect is. We need to know that there is, uh, you know, a, a ton of, uh, major league, you know, future major league contributors at every affiliate, um, and we'll continue to try to develop all of those with kind of the same rigor and the same enthusiasm that we would as if we could all get behind a single one. And on the bullpen side, Craig, the, we've seen just the last few years, especially under Ross here, the last three years, that the bullpen has found success either with, you know, veteran free agent signings um, or guys that are under the radar. You know, again, going back to like Brandon Hughes as an example um, or some of these guys, Manny Rodriguez, some young guys coming up. What is the key to sustaining sustaining that success that we've seen in the past and moving it forward to the bullpen, especially, you know, given the potential additions that you guys might make this offseason? Yeah, I think it is a uh, kind of consistent, scalable, repeatable system and process to identify pitchers for whom we believe we have uh, some developmental unlocks, uh, whether that is a tweak to the delivery, a tweak to the repertoire, a tweak to the usage. And very early on presenting this to those players such that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, implicit in agreeing to come here is buying into the recommendations that we have. Right. Um, you know, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to wait until we meet someone in spring training to say, hey, we have this idea that we think can help you. Would you be interested in trying it and give that, you know, and uh, giving them a chance to kind of think through what we you know, what type of initiatives we might have for them, giving them a chance to ask questions for us to understand what we you know, what has been tried and what hasn't. Uh, and then, you know, as I said, it's, it's a it's a team behind the scenes that puts these ideas together and, you know, kind of presents this information to these prospective pitchers. And then Tommy and CY and, and, and Moscos and uh, the rest of that group deserve a, a ton of credit for uh, kind of rigorously adhering to those plans. Um, and, you know, as you talked about, how often am I speaking to, to Tommy? Um, you know, often enough to, uh, to you know, to, to kind of understand uh, the progress that we're making, uh, you know, when, if and when it's necessary to deviate. But I do think that, you know, we, we've, those guys have, have, fairly earned the reputation of having success for, uh, you know, with, with relievers who are maybe coming off down years, um, you know, to where I think we've done a pretty good job of identifying what might be driving that and, and how we might mitigate it. The organization, you know, we hear, you mentioned the top prospects, you know, a few years ago, whereas Elza and Marquez, and, you know, even now we see, you know, Jordan Wicks or, you know, some of the bigger names, but the depth of it is really impressive when you look at the Arizona fall league where it's, you know, it's in some cases, unless you're a real hardcore prospect uh, follower, you, you might not have heard of some of these guys. How deep is the system right now? And how crucial or how nice is it seeing some of those young guys in the Arizona Fall League that, you know, aren't the household prospect names like a, like a Jordan Wicks or or a Caleb Killian, et cetera? Yep. No, I'm uh, so I'm always reluctant to name names in these types of forums <laughs> because I will invariably miss someone. Um, but I think, you know, you can go up and down our, you know, affiliate rosters and not just, you know, see an interesting arm or two, but look at a rotation and say this, you know, this guy, this, this group of, of players has a chance to legitimately be major league starters or, you know, in the bullpen, there are three, four guys with, you know, you know, with fastballs touching 100 miles an hour and wipeout breaking balls that you're thinking like, yeah, this guy can consistently be around the strike zone. He's got a chance to be a leverage, you know, major league reliever. Um, and I, I don't think that was the case too many years ago. Um, you know, obviously like our, our South Bend team, right, had a ton of success, right? Like every starter from Myrtle Beach ended up in, in South Bend, right? Um, you know, and and I think, you know, that is is kind of what speaks to the health of, of the infrastructure is just, you know, that there are kind of waves of talent. And when one moves up, there's a group behind them. And it's unclear uh, at what point one is going to distinguish himself from the next. Um, but there is just this, uh, you know, kind of trove of talent that I think we're we're really excited about. 
to ask you about kind of a specific guy with Kyle Hendricks. I know, you know, he's obviously the face of the pitching staff in a lot of ways uh, because he's the guy that's been here for the longest. He's the, he's the guy that fans are most familiar with. We've seen just him deal with the injury here and, and some up and down past couple of seasons. So Craig, I ask you, what's kind of the key to him, the biggest key to get back to being the consistent pitcher we saw him prior to 2021? And how does he get there this offseason, assuming full health? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think the the full health is is probably the place to start. Um, you know, getting Kyle like Kyle has very rarely been on the mound and been unsuccessful in his major league career, right? I mean, there have been some ups and downs, but I think it's been fairly easy to tie those back to health. Um, so I think step one two, three, and four is to make sure that Kyle Hendricks is healthy. Beyond that, um, you know, we've identified some changes to his delivery uh, over time, but until, you know, we're confident that Kyle is completely healthy, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to, you know, kind of start to implement some changes there. Um, But we have been, you know, Kyle's obviously a really bright guy and uh, has a, you know, kind of deep burning drive to get better, to get back to uh, the, the level of, um, you know, of success that he uh, formerly had enjoyed, uh, as, as are we. And so, you know, when we've had conversations um, and we've been able to kind of walk through some of the changes that we've identified, he's all in on, on uh, making the adjustments. We just have to get to a, you know, a, a foundational level of health where we all feel confident and comfortable taking those on. We touched on it earlier, but, you know, the, the wipeout stuff and when guys have come up, they've always said, oh, you know, I added a slider or even when a new guy gets signed, it's like, oh, I got this slider grip. What is the I mean, is, is, I guess in as much detail as you can get into, what is the, this, you know, famous, quote unquote, slider grip that all these pitchers are coming up with and, and having you know success with? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm. <laughs> I would say that, uh, like, on on the one hand, it would kind of be easy to paint development in broad strokes, right? Like, if you give anybody a wipeout slider, they'd probably become a better pitcher. Um, It's not quite that simple, right? We are looking at, uh, you know, kind of the way that the body moves through space, uh, some, you know, some things like grips and finger lengths uh, and, you know, the spin components that are derived through release and trying to match optimal you know, kind of working backwards, optimal pitch, uh, optimal pitch shape with, uh, you know, kind of highest um, probability grip to achieve that. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as yeah, changing a grip. Um, sometimes it's as simple as just changing the intentions of a pitcher. It's often, you know, uh, when when a breaking ball gets too big, if we're trying to go for more of kind of like the, the, the zero, zero gyro slider that's a little bit shorter and harder, um, you know, Sometimes it's as simple as like a guy thinking, oh, I wanted to, I thought I wanted to make this as big as possible because I really like to see the pitch move, right? And just kind of reframing uh, the, the objective or the intentions there. Sometimes it's trying to change the way that the arm moves through space and, and working, you know, kind of all the way uh, proximally back to like the, the core and the hips, right? Um, so while the kind of outcome might be similar, like, oh, now this guy has a great new pitch. Uh, I think the way that we get there is kind of, intricate and individual and, and um, you know, is, is unique to each pitcher. Adding on to that, just between adding stuff and velocity and going back to what you mentioned before about just swing and miss in the zone, how do you mix that with command and make sure that guys are in the zone, but also not throwing the ball down the middle of the plate and throwing it, you know, where they want to, like, how do you mix the stuff, the increase in stuff with command at the same time? Yep. So I think the, you know, we, I think everyone has intuitively believed that there is some trade off between stuff and command. I'm not sure it's as strong as many people have committed to. Um, you know, I think what we intend to do with building out stuff is give our pitchers as much margin for error as, as we can. Right. Um, you know, the hundred mile an hour fastball with, with carry through the zone doesn't need to be thrown in exactly the right spot or exactly the same spot that an 88 mile an hour fastball. That's a little bit truer to the arm slot does. Right. So uh, I think getting our pitchers to understand uh, their repertoires and where they'll play best in the strike zone is kind of step one in a lot of ways that's liberating. Um, I think the other thing that we can do uh, as it relates to the execution side of things is just, um, you know, rigorous adherence to uh, feedback, focus, targets, purpose behind every throw, whether that is a 
plyo ball getting thrown into a plyo wall with a target on the wall uh whether that's you know throwing sides into like the old school strings or a nine hole net and uh you know monitoring what the intended and actual locations were to create kind of a game score for that session and understanding you know if they're if they're tracking in the right direction over time uh rewarding not just premium velocities but premium velocities in the strike zone um so i think you know how do you how do you get someone to kind of perform in, in the way that you think is most productive? It's, you know, kind of in, it's ensuring that you're creating an incentive structure that rewards the desirable behavior. Um, and, you know, I think one thing we've learned is trying to trying to prioritize internal cues as it relates to command just tends not to work. Um, you know, the hardest way to kind of move athletically is to think about moving athletically, um, you know. So I think we have very much a kind of constraint-based um, approach, uh, external cueing, multi-sensory feedback um, for this like execution training. Well, Craig, thanks so much. We really appreciate uh, you know a peek behind the curtain here and and, and the pitching infrastructure and just in general uh, all the information and knowledge. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely, I appreciate the time, guys. All right, Andy, we just heard from Craig Breslow, uh, obviously an extremely smart guy. I mean, I, I felt like I learned more in that 20, 25 minute chat than we've had, you know, really in, in so long. Um, it, one of the best interviews I feel like we've had at Cubs Weekly here, just peek behind the curtain of everything that has gone on within the organization. And since he got here three years ago in the pitching infrastructure department, I love your question too, asking him about how often he talks with Tommy, how to be, and he's like more than Tommy would like. So, uh, you know, it, it was great all around, but what stood out to you, Andy, most from our chat with Craig here? Yeah, I think uh, one kidding a little bit of a, you know, tongue in cheek is uh, I like to picture Tommy, how to be like, you know, he sees his phone ringing. And it's like, Oh, it's Craig yeah. again. Like, all right. Um, but no, funny, you know, because Tommy's so nice too, that like, I can't imagine exactly. doing that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the fantasy world, maybe some alternate universe. That's that's what's going on. But no, um, you know, there's there's a lot to to take in. I felt like I got a lot smarter, and I understood the 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 pitching a lot more than than I went in. I thought I had an idea. I, I felt like going in, after going through it, I felt like I really didn't know anything. I almost felt you know, which is a good thing because it, it did show us so much. Um, you know, we, we had heard so much about you know, the slider grip or like, you know, the, the wipeout stuff that they're trying to get. And there's way more into it. And that to me was just so fascinating that it wasn't just like, you know, just like a cookie cutter method that it kind of from an outsider at times seemed like it was that way, which it seems like that's furthest from the, from the case. Yeah. You know, I think one of the big things that Bresler said too, was just that getting everybody aligned and everybody pulling on the same side of the rope in the same direction is huge. That was that was one of the main things that he wanted to do when he kind of took this role a few years ago in the Cubs organization. And as he said, it's extremely difficult to improve if everybody's working in that same direction and moving in that same direction. So I think that was fascinating. I think it's true too. you know, everybody on the same team and, and marching toward the same goal is there. And then just like, I think it stands out when we're talking to him or Carter Hawkins or Jed Hoyer. And obviously every time we talk to Ross or how or any of the coaching staff was there, there just is no complacency with his organization yeah. right now. They, they understand that like they could rest in their laurels and they could be like, Hey, this is awesome. Like finally, after all these years, our pitching infrastructure is developing players and we're seeing success from guys like Samson, like we mentioned before, or a guy like Assad or Wesneski was in the organization for a month before getting up and, and having success in the big leagues. They can rest on that and be like, Hey, look, we did good. But like, no, they're, they're really, they're not complacent. They're working toward getting to that point. They understand injuries happen. They understand regression happens and they want to make sure that there are a number of options. And I love the part where Craig was talking about that. He, they don't know necessarily who the top pitching prospect is because there's a debate, even internally, yeah. the Cubs have a debate about if it's Jordan Wicks, about if it's Ben Brown or Hayden Wesneski or whoever. Whereas a couple years ago and for so long for the better part of a decade, that wasn't the case. It was Edward Alzali. Then it was Braylon Marquez. Now it's different, and I think that's the sign of a healthy organization. So it was really cool to hear Bres Breslow talk about that. Yeah, that was my uh, that was you know one of the things I was going to mention is is that to me was eye opening. Where it was you know it's like all right, you knew it was Braylon Marquez and Edward Alzali, and and that's about it. Now it's it's so deep, and he mentioned you know he didn't want to call out any specific player because he was going to miss them, but you know he looked at the the South Bend Cubs that that won the Midwest League title, and you know they were they had all the success. 
their pitching staff changed, you know, throughout the year when where guys were getting called up from Myrtle Beach or guys were getting called up to Tennessee. Jordan Wick started the year in, in South Bend, ended up in Tennessee. Um, you know, that's that's the sign of a healthy organization. And, you know, it, it's funny because you think about it and, you know, a few years ago, like we mentioned with it was just Albert Alzali or Braylon Marquez, you had to go sign, you know, free agent pitcher to f- augment the rotation, whether it was, you know, someone like Tyler Chatwood or et cetera, things like that. Now you, you you don't necessarily need to do that. And that's crucial because that's extra money that you can spend elsewhere in the organization. That's extra money that you don't have to commit, um, whether it's you, you can use it on the bullpen or a backup outfield or however you want to use it. That's crucial for an organizational for organizational health. Yeah. And as Breslow was talking about, too, they've just had um, they've had a lot of success recently in adding stuff and and having these organizational plans for each pitcher and utilizing those, putting those plans into effect during the offseason. So I'm really curious to see if the offseason, if, if the organization continues to take a, a leap this offseason, where they come into 2023 spring training and the beginning of the minor league and major league season at, and who else pops on the radar that like we weren't expecting the Brandon Hughes and Javier sides of the world that we went into 2022 thinking they were not even on the radar ended up playing huge, huge roles for the pitching staff. So it'll be really cool to to see those storylines play out over the next six to nine months or so. All right, but that'll do it for this week's edition of the Cubs weekly podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple podcast and check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. For Andy, I'm Tony. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week.